Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ivana Totkute, and I work as an AI engineer in Tuplux, which is a company based in Poland, software house, working usually with uh, software with startups based in the US. And today I'll be talking about uh, generative methods and multimodal data retrieval. So why is it important, product search? Uh, I think that this is actually one of the key elements in a successful online business, helping users find the products that they actually need and find the products that they are willing to buy. So this is why reducing the time user needs to find the exact product that he is willing to buy is actually pretty important. So our goal here is to help the users find those perfect products. And the inspiration for products that they're going to buy comes from different sources. So that might be uh, internet inspiration, ad or social network, Instagram, Facebook, anything you name. But sometimes it's also a old school, real life scenario where, for example, you're riding a subway and you suddenly see someone wearing nice sneakers and you think to yourself, wow, I would really like those sneakers, right? And you could just approach that stranger and ask, hey, I really like your shoes, where did you buy them? But that would be too creepy, right? What is not creepy is <laughs> snapping a picture and then searching for that on the internet, or maybe even more creepy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but if you were to just use a plain visual search like Google image search, what turns out is actually it's not so easy to find the perfect thing that you're looking for. You will definitely find pictures that are similar, but they're not of the exact product. So fortunately, with the rise of deep learning, the visual search engines are getting better and better at that. And e-commerce giants such as Zalando and ASOS are creating uh, very good visual search engines. And we're able to use object detection, metric learning, and other things to have a better visual search. But the problem is that still, when you search for something, you might get 6,000 results. And they are somehow similar, but how do you find the perfect one? So uh, there are certainly some tags, attributes, filters that you could use, but they are not perfect. They are usually human created. Uh, they are also, they, they don't have all the possible things that you might want to look for. So would it be cool to be able to just give your natural language query in addition to the image? And this is actually what we are working on. So this is multimodal search, which means that your query is represented by both image and text. And there are two main use cases to use such multimodal search. Uh, one would be when you have an image that is not perfect. So maybe there are some visual qualities that are not represented on the image itself. Maybe you want something that is of a different color, or maybe some elements are in different material. Uh, so this is the first case, but there is also a second one, uh, which actually represents uh, the times when the additional information is actually not even possible to be represented by image itself. It might be the case when you want to say, I want shoes like these, but maybe a bit cheaper, or maybe from some different manufacturer, or very comfortable. So uh, when we do multimodal search, actually in our previous research, we've developed some models that allow to perform this multimodal search and uh, being able to find products in the database that fit both visual and textual features uh, better than the baseline. So that was pretty cool already. And how we did that, uh, we actually used an auxiliary task of classification. So we had this double input from image and text. And then by doing a classification task, we trained our network to learn a multimodal embedding. So this multimodal embedding uh, was not a, a direct target of the training itself, but in the process, it learned how to convey the meaning of both signals at the same time. So now when we had this multimodal embedding, we were able to search for similar vectors in the product space. 
Going even further, uh, we leveraged on the uh, metric learning. So we are going to use that embedding to search for products. So why not directly learn a metric that optimizes for similarity in this embedding space? This is where we used pairs of products where each pair is represented by image and text. Now, this all was pretty cool, but what we've come to realize is that even though the method worked quite well in most scenarios, uh, we didn't really understand what this multimodal embedding really means. So we were not certain whether image qualities or text qualities influenced that more. So we've decided that it would actually be pretty cool to have some more explainability in our model. And the explainable part comes from the introduction of synthetic image. So when we have a multimodal query, we have an input image and text image. We are trying to generate a perfect synthetic image that represents a new visual query that can be later used for just plain visual search. So if a user has an image and he wants to change something in that, we generate a new one and use that for visual search. And now to generate those synthetic images, we had to use scans. And I'm sure pretty, pretty much most of you must have heard about those cool images of fake looking people that are uh, all around the internet. So GANs have gained a lot of popularity and they are actually a pretty cool method to use. Uh, in vanilla version though, they do not allow for any control of what kind of images you might generate. So you feed a noise vector and you get an image synthetically generated that follows the distribution of those images. So in the simple use case, you can generate a lot of images of cats, but you cannot say, hey, give me a cat with blue eyes, right? But this is actually what we want to do. So the cool extensions of GANs is being able to give some additional input. This is where conditional GANs come into play. You can give labels, for example, color labels, and instead of just giving pictures, and then be able to generate synthetic images that represent the given color label. Now, going forward, uh, there are also a lot more interesting GAN applications. For example, Attention GAN, which generates images in a text-to-image manner. So you might have a text description, and then by using Attention Maps, it is able to recreate images with fine-grained details. We've trained the model on fashion data set, and an example of using this method uh, was uh, being able to generate images for this query of bright, long, red party dress. What is cool about this method is actually allows you to see which words influence which parts of the generated image. It's still not perfect, I think, because only bright and red uh, influenced most of the image, but it's already something interesting. But it still does not solve our problem. We want to have both image and text as an input and generate it according to those two signals. This is why we've decided to create something of our own and also to leverage on the metric learning. So uh, based on our previous research where we've learned that to make a better uh, search, you actually, it is actually beneficial to learn the embedding space directly by using Siamese or triplet loss. We've decided to also add this triplet loss to learn better distances in the embedding space. And the idea is the following. So we have image and text signals that are first encoded by image and text encoders and then concatenated to be fed into generator. So now instead of just a plain, plain noise vector that is usually fed into generator in vanilla GAN, we have this representation, simple multimodal representation that is fed into generator and it generates some kind of image. Then during training, uh, the adversarial loss is used as usual. So generator is trying to fool the discriminator by generating fake images. On the other hand, discriminator is trying to differ differentiate between those fake images and real ones. But instead of just using this adversarial loss, we are also adding a triplet loss. And this triplet loss 
verifies how far the synthetic image in the embedding space is far from the, uh, the actual target image. So this is actually one part which is essential in having in the data set. We have those pairs of image plus text equals different image, which allows us to train this in an end-to-end -end manner. And now the information from the triplet loss is then back propagated to generator and discriminator so that the generator is able to, having this information, generate images that are first looking real and second, they are also close to target images so they've learned the multimodal representation quite well. So here are some of the examples when trained on the fashion data set. They are still not perfect, but our idea is to be able to capture both visual and text information to use for the search. So from our perspective, the most important part is to have those features help in the actual retrieval process. So for example, when you have a, on the left, you have an input image, then you have some text query, and the second one is the target image that actually the user is looking for. It is human by some, it is labeled by some human in the fashion and queue data set. And now we, with using just the first image and the text query, we generate the third image, uh, which represents those two signals, and then use it to find the closest matches in the data set. So this way we already know what pictures are we looking for. Uh, there is a, there is some more examples also using a different query. What we've realized, what is actually, uh, we were pretty happy about it, is that the images generated don't only follow the text. This was the issue with some of the other approaches, is that uh, we still are preserving the features from the original image. So this is essentially what user is looking for. Uh, so when we have images on the white background, we are still generating other images on the white background that also follow the text description. Uh, now there are some more results, and if you're interested, then definitely also come by to check our poster, then you'll be able to see them from uh, close distance and verify yourself if it's looking nice or not. So anyways, that was all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, so actually this one would not be a use case to, <clears throat> to have with the GANs, but this is the one that we used in our previous research. So when we had this multimodal uh, deep style Siamese network, we could add like those queries, comfortable, cheap, and stuff like that. Now we wanted to add this explainability, but as you've noticed, uh, you cannot use it with those queries that are not representable by image. So in the perfect use case, we would uh, combine those two methods. Yeah, so we are taking for training just the descriptions, long descriptions, then using some word embeddings for that. It is really interesting to, to see how would this additional metadata such as uh, user comments or user activity leverage uh, the representation and it definitely would also be a new modality that we could add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, this is a very good question. So yeah, for triplet loss, we are not calculating that directly on images. Uh, we're using the same encoder that we have here. So then we have the features uh, that are used to calculate the distance between vectors. So for as for the uh, triplet loss in the GAN training, it actually destabilizes the training. It makes it even more difficult to train. 
so this is why we've explored several of different architectures. What we've come to realize is that uh, using Wasserstein gun architecture helps really a lot. Uh, also having TTUR, so the learning rates for generator and discriminator are pretty important. So this technique uh, actually helps to stabilize training a lot. It means that you don't train uh, generator and discriminator for different amounts of iterations, but you do so, use a different learning rates and use for the same amount of iterations. So, so those were like the main tricks to TUR and Wasserstein-Gain architecture that help training a lot. You have to also be careful about choosing the weights for the adversarial loss and triplet loss. So, in general, we didn't come into much problems with most of the weights. There was not a lot of mode collapsing, but we've noticed that we, if we increase the triplet loss too much, it definitely destabilizes, destabil it makes the training not stable. Uh, yeah, so you have to be careful about fine-tuning those parameters. But in general, it really depends a lot from the gun architecture that you choose. Also, I left like this part, uh, we trained a lot of different architectures, so it actually turned out that it works with most of them as long as there is no mode collapse, so we can use different architectures. Maybe one more question. So how did you gather the target images? Sorry? How did you gather the target images? Like how did you say that's the target one? Uh, yeah, so it was human labeled. There is this data set, Fashion IQ, for fashion images which has those relationships where you have source image plus text image and the result image. The data set is labeled as per differences. So users are given two images and they say, what's the difference between two images? And the user says, this one has longer sleeves and is different colored. So it's not a perfect data set because it does not have those cases where you have the same human wearing a slightly different clothing. So it's not a perfect one, but it it like it generally is quite okay. So this is why the our method was able to train on that even though the data was not perfect. Okay. So that's thanks to your